Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started a little bit early because we have a little more of an introduction. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's Leonard Malice Memorial Lecture. For those of you who don't remember Dr. Malice, uh, he was chairman of this department, um, retiring in 1991, just before Dr. Post joined as chair when he moved over from Columbia. Uh, what I remember about him was uh, that he had a very, very strong sense of what was right, what was wrong. Uh, he loved angiography uh, and would sit in the front row of our conference, the current Tuesday, Thursday conference. He would sit in the very front row uh, up until the time that he retired and then beyond for three or four years as Dr. Post graciously hosted him, uh, and they, the two of them would sit together kind of leading the ship. Uh, one of the things that he was best known for was introducing the use of the operating microscope to New York City in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, he was really a pioneer in innovation, particularly regarding devices. Uh, the thing that he told me he was most proud of was the invention of sequential angiography in which he developed a rapid cassette changer so that you would get serial views intraoperatively when he injected dye in a carotid artery. And that ultimately, ultimately became the basis of serial angiography. Of course, we know him for the malice bipolar, which was just something that he invented in his home workshop. His brother, Jerry, was an engineer, and they kind of fooled around together to figure this out. He was concerned that the bovi, which was currently in use, could lead to seizures and other things as the current was transmitted through the brain to the ground. Um, he also was a pioneer in stereotactic radio surgery, traveling frequently out to uh, Brookhaven National Laboratories, where he would uh, work with the cyclotron out there and radiate animals, and ultimately this came to certain type of stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, he was thought to be a consummate neurosurgeon. Uh, I got to see him do a number of acoustics, and he was very calm, very patient, uh, would sit there for a day, for, you know, seemed like a day at a time uh, in, in, in the Annenberg seven operating rooms where we worked at that time. So at, at one point, his wife, Ruth, uh, who was really almost a member of the department, established this lecture in his memory. Um, but before we go there, as to the introduction of our distinguished guest today, I wanted to give Dr. Kiolka a little introduction to Mount Sinai Neurosurgery. Apologies to those who have heard this before, but there are some number of you haven't. And I think it will kind of put things in perspective. Here you could see uh, the department is a re relatively old one. Uh, Dr. Malice uh, was the sixth, fifth uh, chair. Uh, the, the department stout started downtown and eventually moved uptown um, and has become a behemoth. Uh, not just the department, but the institution. Um, and, you know, I love these numbers here that with 43,000 employees, Mount Sinai is Manhattan's largest private employer. Um, and we see about 1,500 new patients every day. Really, really huge. We're also a big research institution. Uh, the department has changed as has the institution. Uh, when I first got here, the Guggenheim bit Pavilion was just, had just been completed. The Icon Building was not even there, and I was pretty impressed with that. But just a few years later, we've now added uh, more and more structures. The department has grown uh, with a large number of full-time faculty as well as voluntaries, voluntary faculty who are excellent contributors. Uh, the volume has grown to about 6,000. And I was talking to Nino last night about the Sparks discharge data. 
which gives us comparisons uh, and shows that for brain surgery, Mount Sinai has a pretty dominant market share in Manhattan relative to our peers. Uh, Raj was telling me about this article that came out in the current journal of neurosurgery uh, that talks about the relative uh, experience of residents in the operating room. And you could see that we are among the larger departments uh, in the country. We focused over the past few years on research. And uh, we have a very, very large clinical research footprint with 24, 25 actually full-time employees related to the research effort and over 200 actively enrolling IRB clinical trials uh, with a fair amount of funding, both non-NIH and NIH. This level of NIH funding actually puts us as no, no, number one in New York State uh, from Blue Ridge. Uh, this, is not, uh, this is 2022. I just saw the 23 rankings. We've actually dropped to 17, but our peers have also <laughs> dropped. So it just looks like it's getting more and more competitive in the neurosurgery uh, space for funding. Um, continue with Dr. Malice's interest in innovation and device uh, development. Of course, many of you know about Sinai Biodesign, which is our biotech uh, translational program uh, focusing on tech innovation, startup inc incubation, um, and developing major industry uh, collaborations with companies like that you see here. Uh, we're in the middle of a real ramp up of biodesign. Uh, we're going to create uh, what we're calling the Center for Surgical Innovation as we take over large portions of Annenberg 12, which is the medical school area, completely renovate the MC level um, and bring in new angio and operating rooms on the 26th floor. There are a lot of things that I could talk about, but brain computer interface is something that is growing. Uh, nationally, um, and of the five major companies that are involved in brain-computer interface, two of them, Synchron and Precision Neuroscience, um, are run by our own very own faculty, uh, Ben Rappaport, who's here today, and Tom Oxley, who runs Synchron. So that's just an overview, because I don't know if... Uh, you have seen some of these things, and I, I thought you'd like to see it, and I certainly wanted you to see it. Uh, it, it you're, you're, you're in really, really strong company here. Uh, you could see the previous Mal's lectures, uh, some of whom you know very, very well. Um, and um, so we're now going to turn this over to Dr. Germano, who gets to introduce you and embarrass you a little bit. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to be in person. It's nice to see our APPs, residents, neurosurgery faculty, and a special thanks to our neuro-oncology faculty fellow who are here, and neuroradiology, plastics. So I, it's, it's a nice uh, environment. It is a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Nino Chiocca, the uh, 24 lecturer, sorry, the 20th uh, Leonard Malice lecturer in uh, 2024. And uh, um, I have uh, had the uh, pleasure to um, interact and work with him for um, many years because of our interest in, uh, in brain tumors. And I'm giving here two different keyboards. Let's see. I'm sorry. Yeah, this one's good. Um, so um, Dr. Kiyoka has a CV that is uh, the, the uh, thickness of a book, so I cannot recite all his CV, but I thought that in this uh, slide it was interesting to see that, that he really um, had uh, a geographical exposure to multiple uh, programs and finally winded up uh, as a neurosurgery resident uh, at Mass General Hospital. And at that time, probably he did not know that full circle he would uh, come back uh, later in life. He has won um, so many awards that probably uh, 20 slides would not be enough, so we selected just a few on, on this one. And uh, um, most importantly, uh, he has uh, um, been a leader in uh, neurosurgery and in um, um, 
uh, organized neurosurgery for many, many years. Dr. Kyoka was the chair at Ohio State uh, before he became chair at the uh, Brigham. Uh, he has been uh, the chair and or led uh, very important leadership roles in the uh, Society of Neuro-Oncology, in the uh, uh, Society of Neurological Surgeons, in the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, and basically there is not in the Academy of Neurological Surgeons. Basically, there is no organization that has not seen Dr. Kyoka as his president or, or uh, one of his uh, uh, top leaders. Dr. Kyoka is known for his um, incredible energy. Uh, he not only uh, is chair of a huge program, as you saw on that slide, um, we just beat him with one notch. The Brigham is number four on that slide that was just shown. So large faculty. His faculty is highly successful. Uh, when we did a paper on uh, women in neurosurgery, he had the largest number of women at higher ranks than assistant professors. So he has been really a uh, supportive um, individual. Beside that energy, he's also putting energy into research, and I don't want to um, take it away because his talk today will be about uh, some of his research. Um, he has been a leader, not only in the U.S., but internationally. So we are um, very, very fortunate to have you today, Nino, and thank you very much for the honor of your uh, presence. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and also thank you for showing the picture of myself from 12 years ago when I was much better looking. Um, let me see if I can switch this. Good. Great. Well, um, it is a great pleasure to be here, and, uh, and I'm amazed by your program, what you have done, uh, truly, truly a, uh, uh, an, amazing, uh, an amazing academic medical center, an amazing department. Uh, what I want to do today is tell you about um, how I got an invention from my lab into the clinics doing a clinical trial, and it's really a, a 20 year journey, almost a 30 year journey. And some of the results from this clinical trial, which I think are really exciting, especially since we're going now multi-institutional. I do have to give you some disclosures. Uh, let's see, it's this one. Oh. Time to see how to advance. You right there, beautiful. So the only disclosure is really the fact that this particular, uh, it's an oncolytic virus, and uh, Brigham and Women's also has the patent. I'm an inventor of the patent. This was an exclusive license that was given to Candel Therapeutics, and they, uh, they own the license to this. And potentially, uh, if there are royalties or milestones, um, Brigham will get money from that, and that, that's my major conflict, basically. So, first of all, it is just tremendous honor to be the 13th Leonard Malice lecturer. Uh, I, I, I met Dr. Malice when I was, a, I was a PGY2 at MGH, Mass General. I think he came and gave round rounds in about 1991. He must have been right the last year of his residency. And I remember he was very kind and talked to the residents and, and naturally knew about the Malice bipolar. So I was just amazed to meet this person who actually had an instrument named after himself. And again, it's great to be one of the 13th person and really um, be one of the many great luminaries that came here. And, um, and also I wanna thank my good friend, Josh Betterson, who has done an amazing job here, um, really a, uh, a leader um, in neurosurgery. And also Isabel, whom I've known for a long time, um, and uh, whose career I followed and uh, was truly a, a international national leader. We had a recent call with the WNS and it must have been two o'clock in the morning. She was in Edinburgh and she got on this call with us and I was amazed that she was there at two or three o'clock in the morning talking to us by Zoom uh, about some of the international efforts she's leading. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a glioblastoma clinical timeline. You know about this, but as you know, uh, these are tumors for which we don't have an answer. 
Uh, this was one of my patients who was a, um, a CPA uh, who uh, actually was an Iraqi war veteran and he showed up with some speech issues and he's got this gadolinium enhancing necrotic mass near Broca's area. So you take it out and, uh, and then he undergoes chemo radiation and then timozolomide and you can give Optune. Uh, but then this tumor came back in six to nine months, pretty rapidly, right? And so we, again, take it out to surgery, take this out. Uh, you could put them on a clinical trial, you could do some off-label chemo, but unfortunately, this recurred in a much more extensive fashion. He passed shortly after that. So again, the median survival from this tumor, as you know, is still pretty low, 15 to 20 months. Uh, there's some variation based on genetic and demographic markers. As you know, if you have, a, if you have an MGMT methylated tumor, you live longer, you do better, you still end up passing away, unfortunately. Now there has been um, very little success in terms of clinical trials. And it is not because we have not been trying. We know a lot about these tumors. This was one of the first tumors that was ever sequenced by the TCGA effort back in mid 2000s. Uh, but all the clinical trials of targeted therapies have not been successful. Then there was a lot of interest in looking at angiogenesis and those trials have not been successful. More recently, there's been this resurgence of interest in immunotherapy. And some of the immunotherapies have been really successful, some solid cancers. Uh, you know, melanoma used to be a deadly disease, and now it's becoming more indolent. But with glioblastoma, all the immunotherapy trials have also failed. And so the question is, why is that? And so we've been really focused on trying to figure out how we can improve the immune response uh, vaccinate patients or get uh, patients to reject their tumors. So one of the biggest problems with glioblastoma and why we think immunotherapies have failed is that these tumors are notoriously known to be immunologically cold. What that means is if when you look at the tumor, there are very few uh, anti-tumor T cells. So T cells, especially CDA plus T cells, are the cells that have to encounter a tumor. So that's to actually be contact between a cell and a tumor, a T cell and a tumor, for that tumor cell to die. And so if you don't get that T cell into that tumor, you're not gonna be able to destroy the tumor. But it is known now, even with the immune checkpoint trials that have failed, is that there's not enough T cells that infiltrate in the tumor, uh, and they're usually pretty exhausted by the time they get there. And so these tumors have been called immune deserted. This is one of prototypical immune deserted tumors. So if I have to tell you anything about this talk, is this what I'm gonna tell you about, which is this. Uh, what we want to do is change the picture in these tumors, change the microenvironment of these tumors, turn these tumors from cold tumors to hot tumors. And we want to do that clinically by injection to the tumor of an oncolytic virus. So really what we're trying to do is change the microenvironment of the tumor from an immunosuppressive tumor, there's lots of immunosuppressive so-called myeloid cells into one that has uh, more immunoactivated myeloid cells, as well as tumors that have very few immunoreactive T cells into cells that have more immunoreactive T cells. That is what we're trying to do. So why an oncolytic virus? So oncolytic viruses have been around for a long time. Uh, if you take any wild type virus, um, it likes to grow in areas that have microenvironments just like tumors. These are the famous Hannah and Weinberg um, hallmarks of tumor genesis papers, where they describe what phenotypes tumors have to acquire to really become tumors. And you know some of them, as you see, are have to do with resisting cell death, uh, avoiding immune destruction, deregulating cellular energetics, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out that viruses in general like to grow in areas like this. They like to grow in areas where there's lots of proliferative signals, just like a tumor. They like to evade growth suppression. They like to grow in areas where there's blood vessels so they can get nourished themselves, et cetera, et cetera. 
So this is already a biological rationale why a wild type virus might grow better in a tumor compared to normal tissue. So there have been several efforts to then change these wild type virus into virus that are more tumor selective. And there's been a big effort to do this with a number of different viruses. And these are all the clinical trials of OVs, OVs means oncolytic viruses, both in DNA RNA viruses for glioblastoma. And as you can see, viruses like adenovirus have been genetically engineered so that they can infect primarily tumor cells and not normal cells. Same thing with HSV, vaccinia, parvovirus, measles, polio, rio, retro. I still have not seen coronavirus, but I'm sure somebody's working on that, making a coronavirus that's, virus that's tumor specific. So what is the idea behind this? The idea is that once you make a virus that's tumor specific, I'll tell you a little bit about how we did with one of the, vi the viruses I'll tell you about. Then you can inject it into a tumor. Sometimes they're giving it systemically in some trials, but in theory, you can inject it into a tumor and this virus will start infecting some tumor cells. So really, there's a first mode of action, which is the virus is going to directly kill the tumor cell. We call this the direct cytotoxic action. And in fact, for the, long, for the longest time, most people focus on this. How can you make the virus more cytotoxic? How can you make it more selective? But I've got to tell you, this is probably a minor component of this therapy. The second component, which is probably more important, is that clearly, once you start killing cells through a viral infection, you're gonna activate a number of inflammatory responses, such as interleukins, interferons, uh, various cytokines, which actually, even by themselves, also have anti-tumor effects. So you basically are causing an innate inflammatory response that tends to make the, virus, the tumor more hot, tends to make the tumor cells live less, they just don't like that. And for a long time, people were actually were really focused on this aspect too. But the third aspect, which I think is going to be the sine qua non or the reason or non-reason why these therapies might fail, is to actually turn this innate inflammatory response into an adaptive response. What that means is that as you have T cells coming in and trying to wipe out virally infected tumor cells, can you re-educate them to also start recognizing tumor antigens? Uh, and as you re-educate to recognize tumor antigens, can you now start getting a vaccination response? And this is where everybody is now focused. How do we make these T cells that are coming in start recognizing more tumor antigens and not viral antigens? And that is the big question mark. So. Um, so this field recently has I've seen several um, publications in high impact journals. So the Duke group published in 2018, their phase one with polio virus. Again, this is a polio virus that was engineered to primarily infect glioblastoma cells. Um, and, uh, and they did a phase one and they saw this tail of responders, about 20% of their patients seem to live long-term. It made 60 minutes first, and then finally made New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and then um, a, a few years ago, there were a couple of different oncolytic viruses. The one on the left is a herpes virus. The one on the right is a adenovirus from Fred Lang's group. And they, uh, both of those were uh, tried in, pay in kids with uh, high-grade gliomas. And again, they got some interesting responses. And then... Um, Tomoki Todo in Japan had this trial where they injected this particular oncolytic herpes virus, again, a virus that was engineered, so primarily infected glioblastoma cells, and they actually got this um, approved by the Japanese FDA um, based on this trial. And lastly, uh, Fred Lang and Galeriza Day uh, published this combination trial using both an oncolytic virus directly injecting the tumor at the time of surgery, plus pembrolizumab. And again, this is a, a, another paper in a high citation impact journal. So the story I'm gonna tell you about is, was published a few months ago in Nature, uh, and it is this trial. And this is where we, uh, 
use the virus that was generated in my lab and asked to recognize Alex Ling, who's a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. He's a PhD, but he did all of the sophisticated bioinformatic analyses uh, that really made this publication happen. And then Isaac Solomon, the first, the second author, the neuropathologist. And Anna was actually a, uh, a clinical research coordinator that did all our um, uh, serious adverse events. And now she's a medical student at Stanford. And Hiroshi has been with me a long time. He's actually has done some of the original um, genetic engineering of this virus. So again, the virus I'm telling you about is based on herpes. This is a, the common uh, cold sore virus. Uh, and the reason why we started working on this over 30 years ago, when I, was, uh, when I started in the lab of Bob Martuza, uh, was because this virus is uh, a very good killer. It basically can infect human cells, not as much mouse cells, but human cells with high efficiency. Every time it infects a cell, it likes to kill it in 12 to 18 hours. Uh, so it's a rapid lytic cycle, doesn't go into latency in tumors. And then every time you infect a tumor, you make about 500 to 1,000 progeny viruses that can go on and infect other cells. But the trick was always, how do you make a virus that's more selective for tumor cells versus neurons and astrocytes? And so I'm going to skip a lot of preclinical data. I know you're not really that interested in it. But the virus we came up with is called RQNS. It's a big name, RQNS 34.5 E2. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll, call the, I'll tell you about RQNS, and these are all synonyms. RQNS, and sometimes I'll call it oncolytic virus. Sometimes I'll say oncolytic HSV. Or now that it's been licensed to Candel, they renamed it CAN3110. Okay, so, uh, so these are all synonyms. But you know, one of the things that we did early on was really to try to restrict inflammation, replication, the things that herpes virus does to glioma cells. And we did that by placing what's called a promoter. A promoter is a you know, piece of, piece of uh, genetic material that turns on a gene. And this is a promoter for Nestin. Nestin is highly, highly expressed in glioblastoma but the adult brain is not expressed. So you don't see it in neurons, astrocytes, and oligos. So this promoter was placed upstream of a gene in the virus that uh, really controls a lot of the important functions of the virus, that allow the virus to really replicate, cause inflammation. Um, and so we thought that it would be important to put this together. Now we did that because all the previous clinical trials that had been done by Bob Martuza, as well as the there's an oncolytic herpes virus that's actually FDA approved. It's called Imlogic. It's approved for melanoma. And even the one that was approved in Japan, all those viruses lack this particular gene called the ICP34.5. This is an important viral gene that's really needed for inflammation and replication. And the reason they took that gene out is because actually the gene is also thought to be causing herpes hemorrhagic encephalitis. So it has dual functions. It can be neurotoxic, but also makes the virus work better. But because of the potential neurotoxicity, people took out that gene, but when you took out that gene, the virus does not work very well. And so that is why we made this virus to try to express that gene primarily in gliomas and not in normal cells by using this nested promoter. And there's also some additional safety features down here. The most important one is this virus is still very sensitive to antiherpetics. So if you give patients valacyclovir, acyclovir, commonly used antiherpetics, it shuts off. Okay, so we did lots of preclinical trials. Uh, I'll show you in a bit how long this, uh, this worked in mice, uh, spent several years, and finally designed this clinical trial to go to the FDA. And this was gonna be recurrent malignant gliomas. And basically we wanted to confirm by stereotactic biopsy that these were truly recurrent gliomas and then started injecting the virus into the patient's tumor. And we started off with 30 patients and the FDA was worried about neurotoxicity, encephalitis, because we were still expressing this gene. So they started me off at a very low dose of virus, 10 to the six, it's a million viruses. Uh, that's actually very low. Uh, and they're up by half a log all the way to 10 to the 10th and then follow patients for the occurrence of toxicity. So this was the uh, trial due origin design. This is the timeline of how long this took, 
Okay, so basically the initial idea about doing this was when I was uh, starting off my lab in 1999. And then I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is the entire pathway to get to what's called an IND, an investigation new drug application. All this was funded by NIH, Alliance for Cancer Gene Therapy, which is a private foundation, actually out of mind signing of all things. And then, um, uh, and then the Department of Defense as well as philanthropy. So there was no, um, there was no biotech involvement. Um, and so finally, I was able to treat the first patient in 2017 after going through this entire process. Uh, this is actually me in my old Brigham office when we filed the IND. At that time, the FDA wanted 15 copies, paper copies of the investigation new drug application. This is basically all your bioequivalency studies, how you make the product uh, to inject into patients, What's your toxicology in mice? Uh, and this is at about this is about ten thousand patients, uh, 10, sorry, ten thousand pages, multiplied by fifteen. It made my secretary go crazy. Uh, he left me shortly after that. Um, so one of the things that um, the FDA was also worried about was how do you how can you ensure you have a virus that it's the first time you ever express this particular gene? I know it makes the virus work better but also causes herpes encephalitis. You don't start a lot with those, that's great, but how do you make sure that you're really injecting into the tumor and not into normal brain? You know, with stereotaxy, there's still a five millimeter, whatever plate. So we decided to do this in the intraoperative MRI. So we use the clear point system um, to do this. And this, you know, this has been basically around for a while. And, uh, and we actually use this particular needle that's FDA approved. It's called the uh, SmartFlow needle. And it is tapered, as you can see here at the end, as this little taper thing to allow, uh, prevent reflux. And the inside cannula is only 40 microliters. We want to check one mil in one spot in the tumor. So 40 microliters is only not a lot of that space. And we would do this in an intraoperative MRI. And this is actually a picture from one of my patients. My postdoc ended up coloring the brain. This is a patient that had a recurrent GBM. He actually colored the, uh, the tumor here in purple. Uh, you can see there was a tumor cavity, but this seemed to recur. And this is, uh, we came in from this occipitally. Um, and you can see actually the stereotactic needle coming into this uh, needle going into the brain. And if you just see the regular images, you can actually see the, uh, the needle coming into the brain. And this is where we did the injection, single point injection. Uh, I don't think my pointer is working here, but uh, I don't think you see it. But it's a single point injection right at the end of that, right there. Um, so this is where we are with this trial. So we started off at the very top doing a dose escalation in 30 patients, starting in 2017. We ended that in 2020. Uh, and to my uh, great joy, there were no adverse events. Even though we were injecting this virus that causes hemorrhagic encephalitis, patient tolerated really well. Both of them went home the next day, no big issues. Uh, so at that point, the FDA allowed me to then do a second, uh, add another arm, basically, where we treated an additional 30 patients at a dose of 10 to the ninth to expand this cohort and allow me to do not just one injection, one tumor, but up to five injections, different types of tumor. And we finished that in 2021. Um, then uh, we originally were trying to immunomodulate the patient. There was some data showing that if you gave some cyclophosphamide, you could get the virus to replicate better. Maybe you could get Tregs to go down, which are these immunosuppressive T cells. So we did a small trial uh, where we administered cytoxan and treated about nine patients with that. Um, I won't, I won't want to tell you much about that because that trial just finished in 2022 and we're still analyzing the data. And then, of all things, we were able to secure a huge, pretty large philanthropic donation from Breakthrough Cancer to go this, to do this multi-institutionally at four centers, four cancer centers in the United States. 
where we not only did the injection once at one time point, but we did serial injections and biopsies into patients with GBM. And I'll tell you at the very end a little bit about that trial. And so far, we've accrued six out of 12 patients on that. So let me tell you some of the data from the trials. The most important thing is that we treated the first uh, group of patients, and we really tried, once we treated these patients, as we followed them, if we were ever worried about progression, to really um, take out the tissue. But one of the things we found out, which I thought was the important thing, I think that's one of the reasons why this paper made nature, is that we found something after the fact that we did not think was going to happen. We were collecting serology on these patients. You know, HSV-1 is, is um, serology antibodies are widely present in the population. About two-thirds of Americans are positive for HSV-1. And, uh, and, and there were some data showing in, the, in some other cancers, not with this virus, but with other oncologic viruses, that serology did not matter. Um, but we still collected it. And so in this graph, what I'm showing is the survival curves for patients that were HSV-1 positive versus those that were HSV-1 negative. And, and basically, there was a significant difference in survival. If you were seropositive, you did much better. The median survival for these recurrent GBM patients, some of them were first, second, third, fourth recurrence, some of them were actually multifocal GBMs, was 14.2 months. While that for the HSV seronegative patients was about 7.8 months, which is what the historical survival has been reported. So we almost doubled that survival. Now, we have to be careful because even though we collected the antibodies prospectively, we did this retrospectively. So to validate this, we will need to do a validation trial prospectively to really look at this. But we also did some multivariate analyses. These are Cox proportional hazard ratios. And basically here we're looking at all the things that potentially could affect survivorship, tumor volume, dose of the virus, time from diagnosis, age, gender, MGMT methylation, whether the patients were getting steroids, number of recurrences, current performance scale. And interesting enough, the most significant independent predictor of response was HSV serology. If you are positive, you did better, which is counterintuitive, right? You're injecting a virus. If you're positive, you think you're going to get rid of this virus. So that was totally counterintuitive to me. So then I asked, well, maybe this has something to do with maybe patients that are HSV seropositive are more immunally, immunologically fit. Maybe they, they just have a better response to anything. So luckily, and I don't know why, but we also were collecting serology against HSV2. This is the virus that causes genital sores. And um, HSV2 is a different virus. About 30% of the genetic sequence of HSV2 is different from HSV1. So it really is almost a different virus. Uh, and the antibodies don't cross-react. And w when we looked at that, there was absolutely no correlation. So HSV2 seropositivity did not have anything to do. So this is really specific to HSV1 itself. And we had even more uh, data because Stephen Francis at UCSF, who's an epidemiologist, was collecting at the same time uh, using registry data the serology of patients in California with gliomas. And he had huge groups of patients, you know, 700 plus patients. And it was looking where the serology to viruses predicted any survival benefit in glioblastoma. And there was actually no association between HSV1 serology and GBM survival. And so really being seropositive seemed to really dictate your responses as virus. So they said, that was interesting. What we also wanted to know was, is there any molecular genetic data from these tumors that we inject to show that there's some effect, some biologic effect? So we really strived to recoup, to, to get these tumors back. Whenever there was evidence uh, in the upper bar, what you see is a zero, that's when we inject the virus. And the question mark, is whenever there was evidence that maybe the tumor was progressing, we would take the back patient for craniotomy to resect that tumor. Uh, and we had several patients that donated their brains to post-mortem analysis, so we had those as well. 
We also had these PBMCs from plasma collected at different time points below that. And then we could do all these amazing multi-omic analyses, uh, uh, not just histology, but bulk RNA sequencing, uh, cytokine analyses, also um, uh, sequencing what's called the T-cell receptor, TCR, to look at different T-cell types that may be coming to the tumor and tracking these. And so let me just give you some of the data from this. So as I said, I started out this talk and everybody talks about you inject this virus, you turn a cold immune disaster glioblastoma into one that's warm and full of immune cells. So the question is, is there any evidence when I inject this virus that you get more CD8 cells, these are the cytotoxic anti-tumor T cells, CD4 cells, as well as B cells in these tumors? So I'm going to address that question. So you can do this by immunostochemistry. This is a really work by Isaac Solomon that was the second first co-author in this paper. And he just took visually, you know, one patient up there uh, that has a, uh, that has a pre-injection. You see very few T cells, in fact none. And then sometime after injection, this patient, I think this patient was about 100 days after injection. We actually saw when we resected the tumor that there were lots of CD8 to CD4s. And then you can start seeing that there's, these are three different patients. You can see this accumulation, particularly perivascularly, um, as T cells try to infiltrate from the vasculature into the tumor. And uh, you also see these areas of necrosis in the tumors. And around the necrotic areas, you see lots of CD8, CD4s, as well as B cells around the tumor. And then more importantly, you quantify this. So you use this uh, program that pathologists have where you can look at different slides and they can count. And what you can see is that there was a significant increase just by immunostochemistry in most of the patients. Each one of these lines represents one patient. So this is the initial and this is how many T cells went up. So as you can see, the large majority of these patients, you saw a fairly significant increase both in CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. Not as much in B cells. There were a couple where we had some fairly significant increase, but in most of that did not go up, or at least it was not sufficiently statistically powerful to go up. So yes, histologically, regular histology, you see more T cells coming in there, which may mean that the virus is doing something to increase an immune response. So the second question, okay, who cares? You get more T cells, does that have anything to do with outcome? particularly survival outcome. Does getting more T cells in there make patients live longer? And so this is where Alex Ling, my bioinformatics postdoc, started coming in. Because in our initial analysis of this, it did not seem to really matter. Uh, so here, these are just GBMs, OK? And there's no IDH, but this is IDH wild type GBM. And here we're looking at the change in the number of CD T cells in these tissues before and after injection, and here is the change in CD4 before and after injection. On the y-axis is the survival of patients. So the bigger, you know, 25 months is the biggest. Each one of those dots is a different patient. So on the top it says all N21. These are all the GBMs, but they're zero positive, zero negative. So initially when we first looked at this data, I said, oh, there's no, there's no, there's no significance. But then with Alex, we went back and called that the zero positive versus zero negative. And lo and behold, when you look at just the zero positive, this was significant. It's similar to what I saw with the survival curve. If you're zero positive, there is a increased survival if you had more of a change in your CD8s and CD4s. So then I said, well, this is interesting, but what does, uh, you know, can you show this genomically or genetically? And so we did, uh, $200,000 experiment. Uh, you can send genomic DNA to this company called Adaptive. Uh, I have no stock in Adaptive, but they, um, they basically will do your T cell receptor sequencing. So they basically to look, look at the T cell receptors. Each T cell receptor is unique to a specific T cell. And so they did T cell receptor sequencing in our tissues uh, before and after injection. And so in the y-axis shows the change in tumor T cells before and after injection, that's the graph on the left. 
And basically in the tumor, what you saw is yes. Actually, in this case, both in every patient as well in the seropositive patients, there was a significant increase in survival in the patients that had more different T cell receptors in their tumors, okay? And on the right, there's another immune metric called entropy. Entropy is just an immunological term to, it's similar to diversity. When you have T cells coming to a tissue, the more diverse they are, the better it is, because it means that they're recognizing more antigens, different antigens. And so the more entropy, in other words, the more diverse the T cell repertoire that was coming in, the better the patients did. And that was also significant. So this is in tumor. We also had blood, and we did the same thing for blood, and we saw something very similar. Again, uh, there was uh, the, the patients who had much of a change in T cell receptor, meaning to get different T cells, lived the longer. And clonality is another index of diversity. And the more diverse, in other words, the decreased clonality, when you have polyclonal cells, they're gonna be less clonal. So more diverse. So the more, the less, uh, the less clonality, the more those patients live, okay? So I think what I've showed you is, you get more T cells after you inject this virus, the more the T cells are, the biggest the change, the more patients survive. This is also true genetically, both in the tumor as well as the peripheral blood. So the next thing we did is we looked at the transcripts. Well, this is all DNA in cells. Can you actually look at the RNA sequences? So you can do single cell RNA uh, genetics, single cell RNA sequencing. That is in process. We, ha we have data on that, but I'm not gonna tell you that. But we can do what's called bulk RNA sequence. It's much easier to do where you just sequence everything. And so this is a little complex, but here you're looking at transcript signatures. So every cell will have a certain transcript signature. And what I'm showing you on the, just in B, are the transcripts for things called anti-tumor cytokines. M1 denotes a mild derived suppressor cell that's immunoactive, checkpoint inhibition, traffic of mild derived suppressor cells, and go all the way down. The important thing is that when you look again at all the patients, which is the brown ones, a lot of these are negative. Only a few are positive, like anti-tumor cytokines at the very top, M1 checkpoint. But if you didn't just call out the CO positive patients in blue, most of these immune signatures that are usually indicative of immune activation are positive. Um, and so again, there's this discrepancy where the CO positive patients really seem to have more of immune response, more immune activation. So lastly, the last question, and this may get a little nuanced, was, you know, we're injecting an oncolytic virus. If I told you, the, I told you at the very beginning that the, one of the things these viruses is they replicate, can you actually find any virus in these tumors? Now, people thought that this is really important. And, uh, and if you look at some of the literature on this topic, a lot of people, when they inject the viruses, cannot really find it. It's hard to find. Uh, I think uh, Fred Lang with DNAtrix, uh, the long disease look was two or three weeks later, and he found some virus. But usually they disappear. Uh, I think one of the reasons maybe these viruses don't replicate well, because they've been so attenuated. In our case, what we actually found was virus that persisted in these tumors fairly long. So on the top is one of my patients, uh, patient A. Uh, she has this mass in the right uh, prior layer, very close to the motor strip, actually probably near the motor strip. We injected her. Six weeks later, she shows up. This mass is very necrotic. She's actually getting very symptomatic. So I take her back to surgery, take this out, and it's full of herpes antigen. Six weeks later, there's still two virus there. Okay. But here's patient B. Here's another patient. This guy on top, up there on the left, he has a tumor in the right frontal area. In the middle, what I'm showing you here is the coronal section. You can actually see there's a little bubble on that. That's actually the bubble of virus. There's a little needle going in there. That's the bubble where we inject the virus into the tumor. He does well, but you know, it looks like there's progression. And nine months later, there's tumor going across the corpus callosum, periventricularly. But there's this big mass where we, where we did the injection. So I actually took him out, took him back to surgery, resected that necrotic mass. And it's still full of herpes antigen and lots of T cells in there. And in fact, 
We found this in 12 out of 29 patients. They still had virus in there, even several months later. In fact, we had one patient 801 days after treatment still had virus in there. So initially I thought that was great. And now, no, sorry, let me show you one more, one more case. So here's a very interesting case. This is a patient who had multifocal GBM. He had a tumor in his left occipital lobe on the top. He had a tumor in his temporal lobe, left occipital, left temporal lobe. We actually only injected his left occipital lobe. He lasted about eight months. Right before he passed away, we got an MRI scan showing this necrotic mass where we injected the virus in the occipital area. And then there's the tumor in the temporal area that was slowly growing. So at autopsy, the inoculated tumor was all necrotic. And the non-inoculated tumor had lots of herpes antigen and lots of T cells. So there seemed to be some way in which this virus went from the injection area to another area in the tumor. Yet you had three more nodules in the contralateral hemisphere. We also found by PCR virus, but not in surrounding brain. And so this is still unexplained. I don't know how the virus goes from one side to another. Something that we're, I have a postdoc in the lab working on that, but that's kind of interesting. But I thought this was good. I thought, wow, this virus is replicating. It's going to be around. But actually, that's not good. And uh, what we found is that if you are HSV serologically positive, you are more likely to have no virus persisting. And so it was totally the opposite of what I would have thought. Well, if you're HSV serologically negative, the patient that's been worse, you're the ones that have virus persistent. Okay? And so how do we put all this together? So this is our current model, which is really uh, having the virus, injecting the virus into these tumors is really just starting a little process of replication. But really what's important is if you have pre-existing immunity. If you have pre-existing immunity, this injection works like a prime boost phenomenon. Prime boosting is vaccination, basically. You prime somebody to a vaccine, like coronavirus, you get your first injection, and then you boost your immune response with a second injection. So in this case, what we think is happening is that in patients that are HSV zero positive on the top, at early time points, you inject this virus, and the virus is replicating, but really you have a central memory T cell bank that knows that there's a virus in there, the expands, comes in, and starts wiping out the virus, but also starts wiping out tumor cells. However, in the seronegative patients, they just don't have the time to do that. Uh, by the time they try to become seropositive, the tumor is taken off, and there's no way of provoking the immune response. And so my conclusion, and I think I'll probably stop here, is that we can show that there's a profound inflammatory infiltrating to these tumors, even after several months after injection. We can show that you, patients that survive the longest have higher T cells, have higher T cell receptors in tumors, have more immunoactive immune signatures in tumors injection. So right now we're doing this multiple longitudinal sampling and injection multi-institutional trial. And these are all the people that have collaborated with this. Uh, I've mentioned some of them over the years. Uh, just to tell you about this multi-institutional trial, I'm gonna skip a lot of these slides, but basically what we're currently doing is doing up to six injections over four months in patient recurrent GBM. Uh, we're harvesting by biopsy multiple areas of these tumors and then treating each one of these biopsy by multi-omic analyses to look at the entirety as much as possible, the proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, every omics you can think of. Um, and so far, we've done six patients, we've been able to acquire 316 biopsies from these patients. Um, and you can see from each patient how many biopsies. Patient six just underwent their second uh, injection and biopsy. So we're injecting the virus and biopsying, going back two weeks later, injecting the virus, biopsy, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and we're sending all these to all these different labs for all these fairly sophisticated analyses. And I hope that, um, I think this will take a couple of years for this trial to finish and, and look at all this data. But I hope to be able to tell you more about that at that time. Um, this is actually patient number two at the end of her sixth injection. She actually flew in from Washington. She allowed us to use her name, image. This is her husband there. Uh, 
uh, cherry um, farmers from uh, Eastern Washington State. And uh, she came in, would fly in, get her injection, usually fly out within a few days. We've turned this into an outpatient-like procedure. We have had patients go home the same day, all under, general, under, all under conscious sedation anesthesia, then undergo general anesthesia. Uh, and we usually use the same borough from a previous craniotomy. So we can do all this, and these are all the people that are in, uh, participating in this multiple injection trial. So thank you. was a riveting talk, uh, and I know there are, are questions. I'll start with a really simple one. We used to hear the old time people like Dr. Malice talk about the beneficial effect of a post-operative infection, uh, and there were people who would, you saw crazy things happening with E. coli. Is this somehow related? Um, uh, that's a good question, right? There's always been this issue about whether infections improve GBM. Um, Nothing's really been proven. Um, it may be related. Uh, it may be that this is not particular to this particular virus, but every time you're boosting your tumor with something that you have pre-existing immunity to it, maybe you get more of an immune response. And there's been some mouse data showing that that is true for other viruses, like flu. You know, people, there was a PNS paper a couple of years ago where showing that if mice were immunized to flu and then you injected a flu into a glioblastoma in mice, they got a much better response. This is out of the um, University of Minnesota group. So there may be some truth to that. Yeah, I know that's a, those are great points, fantastic points. Uh, yes, yeah, so Nestin is, uh, is thought to be actually one of the GBM stem cells markers, as you know, as well as others. And when we first did the Nestin experiment, that's when exactly, that when we first decided Nestin, that's exactly when the paper started coming out about the stem cells. So I said, this is great, we're making a virus look at stem cells. Uh, when we do our immunohistochemistry in patients in this trial, we actually found Nestin pretty much I don't want to say homogeneous, but it's in a lot of the tumor. So it's not really restricted to different areas. And we actually have some of the figures in that paper uh, and supplementals showing next in expression. And we found it pretty, um, pretty widespread in every patient. I think there's only a few patients where it was not that widespread. So it may be more, uh, and there's this entire story about what is a GBM stem cell. Some people have said about up to, almost 50% of the GBM could potentially be a GBM stem cell. So, I think it's going to be more widespread in the tumor than we think. I also think that I was of your same idea initially that the virus should infect every cell, but I don't think that matters. I think what the virus needs to do is infect some cells 
and then get the immune response primed up and getting T cells re-educated to start responding to other antigens outside of the viral antigen. I think that's going to be the trick to make this therapy better. Um, and that's what my lab is focusing on, more than focusing on different promoters. Um, it's trying to focus on how do we improve the re-education of T cells going from virus infected cells to other tumor cells, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Nina, congratulations. This is an amazing amount of work, and it really shows. I have a question about um, uh, the uh, adenovirus, uh, HSV, PK, Dexic, uh, that then you uh, modify into the field. So both you and I published a trial, or I think it was almost 20 years ago now, showing that was uh, good with a phase one, and then it went in phase two, and then failed uh, subsequently. But uh, why not? Um, combining that suicidal gene therapy concept with this uh, new concept of hot and cold. And by the way, in that paper, I just went on Google because I didn't remember, in that paper in 2003 that we have published here at Sinai, there was one picture where our neuropathologist, Dr. Morgello, I don't know if she's here today, uh, had told us, hey, you got a lot of macrophages. So it, it, it kind of, you know, was noticeable, but clearly yeah. all the knowledge was, yeah. was not there. Uh, but so the question is, why not um, combining the uh, uh, suicidal uh, effect with uh, the immune effect? Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. And clearly, this virus still has TK, so you could do that. Uh, there were a couple of patients in this trial where we were worried about neurotoxicity. Um, and we did give them acyclovir. You know, there's two out of 59 patients. Um, we pretty much shut off the virus. Uh, they were, they were IDH, both of them were IDH mutant younger patients. Their toxicity was seizures. Um, one of them didn't do well, the other one lived pretty long, so I don't know whether that was an effect or not. But it's, it's a trial that could be done. As you know, every time you do a trial, it's not easy. You know, once you want to combine two things, then you've got to get more stuff. So, yes, that's, that's a great idea that we could potentially do. Yeah, that's a great, great, great idea. So there's a, yeah, several people are thinking about that. Um, I know Carl June's group at Penn has got a program trying to do that. And uh, uh, what's his name? Um, it's Cincinnati Children. Somebody's trying to do CAR T cells plus a different oncological virus. So that's out there. We haven't done that. We don't have a lot of CAR T cell expertise at my place, David at MGH. I've been talking to Marcella Mouse. A little bit about that to see whether we could do something. Um, again, the problem is trying to combine two therapies is always. I'm, I'm just trying right now to get to this zero biopsy trial, <laughs> which is taking three years of my life to get done. <laughs> just trying to convince people that that's okay, we can do it. Mm -hmm. It seems like that would be, yeah. And, and that would also solve the problem of HSV seronegativity. Come work in my lab. <laughs> yeah, so the, so the, uh, that's a great, that's a great thought. Yes, yeah, so we're thinking about through the same lines. So one of the big problems that I found out, yeah, first of all, I'm not an immunologist, right? I've been drag kicking and screaming into immunology, which I used to hate, but now I love. Um, so the, um, the one thing I found out, which is kind of interesting, is that we, there's a lot of data on what T cell receptors respond to what viral antigens for flu, coronavirus, CMV, EBV, as well as a couple of the viruses. Zero for HSV1. Nobody actually has any data on what T cell receptor identifies which viral antigen, which is to me surprising. I even asked Adaptive, which is one of the companies that we sent this money, you know, do you have something secret? And he said, no, we, we don't. It's been really tough to identify those. So we actually don't have any idea what T cell receptor sequence recognize uh, some of the well known immunodominant epitopes of HSV1, which to me is flabbergasting that nobody's done that. Um, 
Great. So, so one of the things we're doing now is trying to do that, as well as trying to figure out, because we have so many T-cell receptor sequences, especially in this multi-institutional trial that we have, this multiple biopsies, and trying to do some experiments uh, where we try to figure out what those T-cell receptor sequences are responding to and doing some of this work in vitro. Yeah, so uh, um, most people think that uh, viral latency only occurs in certain populations which are really trigeminal sensory neuron ganglion cells, and that you don't see latency in other cells, maybe in the basal forebrain, uh, um, but um, viral reactivation has not really been seen, or viral latency has not been seen in other cells. Um, but, you know, is there a way in which you could make a virus that remains latent in cell-thin tumors? And then when a tumor, for example, starts dividing, it like goes from neural stem cells to a dividing cell, and the virus comes up and kills it. I mean, it's a great, it's a great project. It could be done, potentially. Um, I don't know of anybody that's done it. I know that there is, that's a potential. We've looked in our specimens for a lot of them whenever we said, especially the one, the one patient I showed you where the virus goes into one area from one area to another area, we said, well, maybe that's reactivated virus. Maybe this patient has latent HSV1. It turns out you was CR negative, but maybe it's still he has latent HSV1. So we actually PCR'd out the virus from those areas that were not injected, and it was RQ nested. It was not wild that virus. Follow up injections that system. What what difference would you think would it make? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my personal opinion is HSV1 is not a great systemic virus. There are some that are better. The problem with HSV1 systemically, first of all, the virus we made, I didn't go through all the details, but it does have some other safety features. It gets inactivated by complement really fast. Uh, as well as by antibodies, it's missing certain moieties. It was a safety thing that we put in there. So, so basically, if it gets into the circulation, it gets inactivated. And so this particular virus that we made would not be great to deliver systemically. Uh, we did some primate experiments back in the early, actually, Brian Ho, when he was in my lab, he's the chair of Florida, did some primate experiments with us. He would do arterial injections of the virus to see if we could get a cross the blood brain barrier into uh, just primate brains, no tumor. Just didn't have a lot of luck. Most of it got soaked up in the liver, and we just did not see a lot getting into the brain. So I think with this virus, which is pretty large, it may not be the best or systemically. Um, but um, there are other viruses that are being delivered systemically. Thank you. Uh, so, this, so this is a this is this breakthrough cancer team that involves res, uh, people and residents from four different institutions. In fact, you see some are not in our place, like Ingo, for example, Ingolf and others. Uh, the resident team would be here. Oh, sorry, and uh, over the years, uh, Josh Bernstock, he's a PGY4. Uh, that's been working with us in the lab. Um, 
And there are a couple of resident neurosurgeons from other countries, Yuro Takahito and now Shona both from University of Tokyo. Um, those are the ones that have been primarily involved. There have been, uh, this is just particularly for this one particular project, which is a clinical trial. But over the years, I've had lots of residents come through our lab to work. Thank you. I appreciate it.